All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Diana. It's a pleasure to be here today talking about something that I've had on my radar for about five or six years now. This is an invasive insect which is causing quite a few problems out in the eastern U.S., the mid-Atlantic states, especially Pennsylvania, New Jersey, parts of New York and similar areas. But uh, since its introduction in 2014 in that part of the country, it has been expanding westward. And we're going to look at uh, some more recent maps here in just a moment. And we'll see that it is slowly but surely making its way towards Wisconsin. So looking at the uh, attendee list, I'm guessing most folks uh, watching are from Wisconsin, although I saw in the chat there's someone from Indiana. And so there may be folks from the general Midwest, and hopefully this is a way that you can get to learn a little bit more about this particular uh, invasive insect. Now, I do also want to point out, uh, if you are interested in getting handouts for today's talk, I do have those posted on the website for the UW Insect Diagnostic Lab. So you could follow the URL link that I have on this slide. So take a screenshot of that or, or photograph of that. I will also have that same link posted on my question slide at the very end. So you'll have another chance to grab it then. All right, so first and foremost, what is the spotted lanternfly? This is an, a type of invasive plant hopper from Southeast Asia. If you look in the literature about the native range, it's places like China, um, also to the south a little bit, locations like Thailand, so that part of the globe. Uh, it doesn't seem to do well in particularly hot areas, so tropical areas, uh, not so much a pest there. It really comes from more parts of the globe, parts of China, for example, that uh, are similar kind of latitudinally and, and climate wise to us here in parts of the US. So that's the part of the globe that it's from. It has actually moved through other parts of Asia where it's not native to. So it's uh, an invasive in Japan. It's also been spreading around the Korean Peninsula uh, since the early 2000s. And it has become a problem there in locations such as South Korea. We had our first detection in the US back in late 2014, September 2014. It was detected in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. If you look at the history of invasive insects uh, here in the US, they tend to come in at the coast, uh, East Coast, West Coast, because that's where we have a lot of shipping. And historically, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that kind of general Philadelphia area, not too far away from there, there's been a long list of invasive insects that show up in that part of the country, and then they spread westward from there. So with that said, uh, it's definitely established here in the United States. It's not in Wisconsin yet, but it is getting closer. And we're going to look at some maps in a moment and look at some of those more recent uh, kind of scattered detections. Now, a reason that this insect is a concern, a uh, couple of reasons. Actually, it has a very broad host plant range, meaning it can feed on a very wide range of plants. So there's agricultural concerns with this particular pest, uh, as well as horticultural concerns, issues with landscape trees uh, and similar plants as well. So not only does it have a broad host plant feeding range, it seems to be a pretty good hitchhiker, uh, especially the egg stage. So many of you on today's talk may be familiar with the spongy moth, which was formerly known as the gypsy moth. That insect can also be moved around as egg masses and spotted lanternfly, very similar to spongy moth, will lay these egg masses and that's how it spends the winter. Uh, and if those egg masses are on non-plant material, that can get moved long distances. When you actually look at the dispersal capabilities of this insect, they have done some kind of catch and release studies where they will capture some of these, maybe mark them with colored paint or some other way to indicate that they have looked at that individual and then release them and come back at some later point in time two days, four days, a week, week and a half, uh, you name it. Uh, they have found that generally these insects don't seem to travel very far on their own. And some of the catch and release studies I have seen data for, uh, the released insects are often found within a, a matter of maybe 10 meters to maybe 40 meters or so from the trees. So they're not moving terribly far distances on their own. They're not strong flyers. As adults, they're maybe flying perhaps a little over 100 feet, um, but they're not uh, just hopping and, and flying miles and miles down the road on their own. Uh, otherwise, the juvenile stages can't fly. They just can, tend to kind of hop or crawl where they're going to. So it's human transport, which is really driving the story here. So again, to go from eastern Pennsylvania to parts of Indiana, which is our closest location, it was humans that did that. It's not the insects moving themselves. So humans are a crucial part of the story. 
Now I mentioned that these have a very broad host plant feeding range. One really key plant to point out, and I'm going to expand upon this uh, later on in about 10, 15 minutes, is a plant called Tree of Heaven. And this is not a native plant here in Wisconsin. It's an invasive plant, Elanthus altissima. Uh, we do have a uh, known detections of this in parts of the state, especially southeastern Wisconsin. Southeastern Wisconsin is going to keep coming up again and again in today's talk. You'll notice a theme jump out both for Tree of Heaven, but also some of the models predicting where this insect might be able to make a decent go of things. We've also had some issues with this insect on agricultural crops, in particular grapes. We have had some uh, significant damage out east in Pennsylvania, and grape growers out there are having yield losses or having to spray lots of insecticide to deal with this. There have also been some uh, issues reported on tree fruits, including apples, peaches, and things like that, especially for some of the younger juvenile stages, as well as hops uh, used to produce beer. So there's been some issues reported on that. For a lot of us here in Wisconsin, uh, I think a big concern is going to be issues to landscape trees. It turns out that these insects are gregarious and you can literally get hundreds or thousands of them on a single tree trunk. And if they are sitting there drinking sap out because they've got these tubular sucking mouth parts, kind of like a mosquito, they drink sap, they secrete excess sugars, we refer to that as honeydew, and that can just make a really sticky, icky mess when you think about it and you can get mold that grows on that too. They've been documented feeding on a very, very wide range of host plants. Uh, some of the maples like silver and red maples uh, are one that they really like. Uh, certain walnuts like black walnut they seem to do very well on, poplars, willows, and some other things as well. So uh, in parts of the eastern U.S. where this insect is problematic, they get a lot of calls and concerns from the general public because people just have thousands of these in their yard congregating on trees, and they're relatively large insects. We'll talk more about that in a second, what they actually look like. So uh, this is definitely something that we want to keep an eye out for. If you find a live one or a dead one, we would like to know about it. I'll uh, finish up today's talk talking about uh, where you should go to report that. But in a nutshell, either myself or colleagues at DATCAP, the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection here in Wisconsin. So if you find this one, we really, really, really want to know about it because we have not found any live specimens here in Wisconsin yet. It could show up this year. It could be five, 10 years before it does, but it most likely will show up at some point. Now, I do also want to illustrate, we have technically seen some dead specimens show up here in Wisconsin. So these are perhaps the first warning shots across the bow, so to speak. If we look at this photo in the center, this was uh, a specimen that was, uh, the photo was submitted to me by a pest management professional from southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, this was located inside in a warehouse situation. This was a commodity, of a pallet of goods that had originated in the east Eastern U.S., I believe from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, which again, that's kind of a hot spot for these. It was shipped to that warehouse in southeastern Wisconsin. The dead specimen was found, but again, it just goes to show and illustrate that these are really good hitchhikers. Late last year, November, there was a similar uh, type of situation where dead specimens were found associated with recently uh, planted and transported nursery stock, which would come from the eastern U.S., passed through Illinois, and then was uh, planted in the ground seat southeastern Wisconsin. So again, these insects are pretty good at getting moved around both as eggs, but also sometimes the adult stages can just hop onto materials perhaps where they were trying to lay eggs. And if those materials get moved, so do the insects. So keep an eye out for this one. So let's look at the history and the spread of this one. Now, as I mentioned, spotted lanternfly was first found in southeastern Pennsylvania in 2014. So that's the county where it was first found in Pennsylvania. And as you can imagine, it spread kind of radially outwards from there. So that's the bullseye on the map. Uh, much of uh, Pennsylvania, as well as New Jersey, Delaware, parts of uh, nearby parts of New York, those are the kind of hotspot areas as well as Maryland. But as you can also see on that national map or a regional map, we now have some uh, detections down into locations such as North Carolina, even southwestern Virginia, and then more recently some detections in multiple counties in Ohio, two counties in Indiana, and then outside of Detroit area in uh, southern peninsula of Michigan. So again, for us here in the Midwest, this insect is slowly but surely making its way westward. Again, no detections yet in Wisconsin, but it's probably only a matter of time. So that's uh, a very recent snapshot of where SLF has been documented. 
Now, I also want to share with you some information from some modeling studies. Now, keep in mind that models, you know, it's like weather models, they're never perfect, but it's our best educated guess uh, based on scientific data available. So there have been some models that looked at this. I'll share you a modeling map here in just a second. But one thing I want to illustrate. So if we go on to Google Maps, this is basically what I did with these two maps. And I had the same zoom level. So these things are to relative scale. When we look at South Korea on the left in the Korean Peninsula, so in South Korea, spotted lanternfly, when it was introduced, because it's an invasive there, it basically moved throughout South Korea in the span of about five or so years, popping up on one side of the country to the other. So it has been able to be moved around pretty quickly due to human movement. Well, if you think about the size of South Korea uh, compared to some of our Midwestern states like Indiana, it's really pretty comparable uh, in size. So when we think about that uh, size and scale of the Korean Peninsula, you know, that's very similar distances to what we're talking about to go from Pennsylvania into parts of Indiana and, and things like that. So again, it's probably not going to be terribly long before this insect shows up in other parts of the Midwest, including Illinois, Wisconsin, and uh, potentially Iowa and beyond. Now, here's that modeling study that I wanted to mention. So this was from a paper that came out back in 2019. And the scientists for this paper, uh, included a bunch of environmental variables uh, and variables related to weather patterns. So temperature, winter weather, drought condition, elevation, and things like that. And they put in all these variables to come up with their best guess of where there is going to be suitable habitat for this particular insect. And in a nutshell, the darker color, so the red, that is area in the US that is expected to be good habitat for this insect. And it lines up pretty well with what we've been seeing thus far, at least in the eastern part of the country. So again, southeastern Pennsylvania, that's some really ideal habitat for this insect, as well as New Jersey, Maryland, and, and similar locations like that, as well as parts of New York as well. But then we also see that there is a big swath of red basically going from Ohio and parts of West Virginia all the way across through Indiana, Illinois into Missouri and beyond. And we do have a little bit of red territory here in southeastern Wisconsin. So again, that is parts of the globe that are expected to be very good habitat for this insect based on uh, climatic modeling. Then we see areas that are in yellow. These are kind of okay-ish, decent territory for this insect. So they're kind of ranked as uh, medium or moderate suitability for this insect. And then green areas are going to be low suitability. So we don't fully understand, will the insect be able to get a foothold there? Maybe, maybe not. And then areas that are white are just considered unsuitable. It's probably too cold or there's some other environmental factors that would limit its survival. So what does this mean for us here in Wisconsin in the Midwest? Well, the messaging is kind of mixed for Wisconsin. It looks like the southeast kind of corner or third of the state, maybe, if, if you took like a triangular wedge out of Wisconsin, it's probably going to be good to decent habitat for this insect. So uh, Racine, Kenosha, Milwaukee, Walworth over to Dane, Rock County, things like that. But then also you have to think about the buffering effect of Lake Michigan. Uh, that helps with the climate going up to Door County, where we, of course, do grow a lot of fruit in that part of the state. So there's definitely going to be some agricultural concerns here in Wisconsin. The North Woods, good news at the moment at least, is that this insect probably isn't going to do very well that far north because of some of the cold winter temperatures and other factors. So it's really going to be a mixed bag for us here in Wisconsin. But I do want to point out, we're looking better, uh, according to the model, than some of the states just to the south of us. If you look at a state like Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, and Missouri, they're almost entirely red, meaning this insect is probably going to have some really good climate conditions. You also have to keep in mind that over the next 20 to 50 plus years, with changing climate and shifting winter temperatures and things like that, this model will likely change. We'll probably see that red push northwards over time, but this is a current snapshot, our best guess uh, from the scientific community of where this insect could probably do well. Now, I do also want to point out, uh, if you jump to the west coast of the U.S., where we know California grows an awful lot of grapes and other agricultural products, if this insect were introduced there, it's probably going to catch on and be very problematic there as well. So uh, if this insect was shipped out there as eggs or other life stages, there's definitely concerns on the west coast. It's not just an eastern U.S. concern.
So let's talk about what the insect is. Uh, part of the effort of today's talk is to uh, just increase your general awareness of this so you can keep an eye out for this insect. Luckily, as far as invasive insects go, this one is really easy to identify. There's really very few things that even come close to the appearance of this. So let's start with that upper right-hand picture. This is the adult stage, a side view. They are pretty large insects, an inch or more in length. We know in general, a lot of our insects are going to be smaller than that. So it's a pretty darn big insect as far as insects go. It's also got a really unique appearance, uh, actually a rather pretty insect to look at when you see it. It's got these cool grayish dots and dashes, so kind of a Morse code pattern on the forewings. If you were to open those wings up and spread them, uh, that's what we see on the bottom right-hand photo. The hind wings actually have this very beautiful, brilliant neon pinkish color. Again, very few things are going to look like that. Back to the top photo, you can see that pink kind of showing through that semi-translucent uh, uh, forewing. Now, also, if the wings are spread, there's some distinctive yellow coloration on the abdomen. In general, that's going to be hard to see with live specimens, because usually when they're on plants, their wings are going to be folded back over their body. But that's what they look like, some spots, grayish, blackish, some neon pink on the hind wings. Now, I mentioned this earlier, they're generally not strong flyers. So even though they do have wings, if you were to catch one of these and release it in the air, I've seen some studies that they might go upwards of about 40 meters, which is about 120, 130 feet, somewhere in that range. So not strong flyers at all. Uh, if you have a female that has mated and has a batch of eggs inside her abdomen, she's going to weigh more. She's going to be able to fly less. So they're really not good at moving themselves around. But again, if they hop onto a potted plant or a pallet of goods and humans move that or they hop into a vehicle uh, or a trailer, something like that, and they get moved across the country, it's humans that are playing an important role moving these insects around. They also can hop and crawl. Uh, the juvenile stages we'll talk about in a moment. They're very strong hoppers and crawlers as well. Now, in terms of their behavior, these can be gregarious, meaning they can hang out in a group. So when these adults are feeding together on the trunk of a tree, you can easily get hundreds or thousands of them. So imagine having thousands of inch long, large insects feeding on a tree. They're all sucking fluid sap out of that tree and excreting excess excess sugars in their excrement. We call that honeydew. That's going to make a very sticky mess and also a very messy one as well. We'll talk about and show you some photos later on of what that can actually look like. We'll talk about the biology uh, and life cycle a little bit, but in terms of the adults are out later in the season, there's only one generation per year that we've seen here in the U.S. The adults are out more like late summer and in the fall. That's the time of the year that they are mating and ultimately laying eggs. Now, here's what the juveniles look like. The juveniles are going to be smaller than the adults, and when they first hatch out of the eggs, they're not going to be very big, maybe somewhere in the ballpark of a quarter inch long or so, give or take. Uh, eventually, they will get larger and look uh, a little bit different in terms of their coloration. So the juveniles actually go through four instars or substages. The first three of them uh, are black with white polka dots. So pretty cool looking insect, really nothing else that looks quite like that. If you are familiar with stink bugs, uh, certain juvenile stink bugs might look similar in terms of their size, kind of their general posture, but only this one is going to have that black, very uh, contrasting black appearance with white polka dots. So again, those are small. They start out an eighth of an inch to maybe a quarter of an inch. They do get progressively larger. So the first three instars or juvenile substages are black and white. The fourth one has a different appearance. This is going to be the lar largest juvenile stage. They are black and red with white polka dots on the body. So again, very distinctive in terms of what these things look like. We can see that fourth instar nymph or juvenile, the bottom right-hand picture. You can also notice uh, kind of a clue that it's getting to be more mature and that there are wing pads or wing buds. These are stubby little things that you can look at that and tell in the photo, those are going to turn into wings. Uh, so this is kind of that adolescent or teenager stage, if you will. Next, they would molt and transform to the adult stage. So they do differ in the or appearance. Uh, all the juvenile stages though, are very active. And uh, what's interesting about these is they have some shifts in their feeding preferences, which we'll expand upon a little bit later today. Uh, but in general, the very young ones start feeding out on succulent tissues on a wide range of landscape plants. So it could be herbaceous, perennials, and things like that. As they mature, they get to that fourth instar where all of a sudden they are black and red with the white spots. 
Uh, at that point, they start shifting more to feeding on, on plants that are woodier, so trees, shrubs, things of that nature, kind of tougher tissues that they can poke their mouth parts through. And then the adults like to feed on those more woody plants as well. But we do see this shift from more uh, softer tissue herbaceous plants towards woodier things as they mature. This is another important life stage. Uh, the eggs, this is how they overwinter. So those juvenile stages would be out in the Midwest here, likely in uh, late spring through the summer months, reaching maturity with adults later in the summer. This is how they overwinter though, as the eggs and the eggs are in general, a more tolerant life stage. The eggs themselves, when they are laid, are laid in batches of several dozen, about 30 to 50 eggs. And a given female might lay one to two of those. So she doesn't have thousands of eggs, she might produce a hundred or so, give or take. Uh, the egg masses we can see in this photo on the right, that's what they look like. It really doesn't jump out at you as being eggs. It looks more like some grayish putty stuff, like if you're playing with silly putty or something like that. Um, if anyone has ever uh, patched a muffler and you get that grayish putty stuff that you put on it, it kind of reminds me of that. So the actual eggs, you can see a few of them sticking out on the upper portion of that photo. The blackish or dark brownish eggs themselves are covered up with this grayish secretion that helps protect them, regulate perhaps the temperature a little bit, helps regulate the humidity. Um, as an important factor. So those are covered with a protective uh, secretion. They'll spend th go through the winter. So they spend the winter as that egg stage. They then um, eventually hatch out in the spring months and that grayish coating does uh, disappear over time, especially as they get close to uh, egg hatch. Now, in many cases, these eggs can be laid on plant materials. So that could be on tree trunks or large branches, for example. We'll talk a little bit more later where those will be um, because that's something we can do is look for these, although they're not always the easiest to find because often they're up fairly high. We'll get to that in a moment. But sometimes they're laid on man-made objects. And again, that's a reason why this insect can be such a good invasive species, because if this egg mass is on a pallet or the underside of a personal vehicle or a work vehicle, and you take that from Eastern Pennsylvania to Wisconsin, you could be moving batches of these dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of them, if there's a lot of egg masses present. So uh, again, with that gregarious behavior of the adults, if they're hanging out in the same spot, depositing a whole bunch of eggs in the same area, again, you're not just moving one egg, you could be moving a whole population of these. So we have a big concern with that. This uh, slide just illustrates that a little bit further. So this is an entomologist who happens to be on Twitter. Uh, and I saw this post from him a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and he's basically said there is a tree of heaven, a preferred host plant for spotted lanternfly. He lives in the Eastern US, by the way. Uh, and so we see this tree of heaven, that greenish tree in the center of the photo, a uh, bunch of spotted lanternflies around there. And there's a car parked right there. Now, uh, in the caption, he mentions that this is a Michigan plate. It turned out that was a Massachusetts one, but uh, it gets the point across. If that were a Michigan or a Wisconsin plate and spotted lanternflies laid dozens of egg masses on the underside of it and that person then drove to Wisconsin, again, that's an easy route of movement for these insects. So that's where we have a big concern for movement. We actually think that this insect got into the U.S., through movement of egg masses on non-plant materials. I think it came in with a shipment of landscaping rocks from parts of East Asia. And once those eggs got here and hatched, again, Southeastern Pennsylvania, based on the modeling paper, perfect climate for it there. So it uh, caught on and has been spreading outwards from there. Let's very briefly look at the life cycle. These insects are univolting essentially meaning they have one generation per year. So they overwinter as eggs at about the nine o'clock position in mid spring. This is based on the phenology we've been seeing in the Eastern US. So in mid spring, those eggs are gonna hatch. Then during the spring and early summer months, we're gonna have the juvenile stages. So those first three instars are black with whitish spots. Uh, in the summer months, we're going to get the more mature uh, nymphs or juveniles where they are black and reddish with white spots. And then in mid to late summer, that's when we might expect to see the adults. And once we get those adults, they will also be feeding just like juveniles, but more on woody plants. They're also gonna be mating and laying eggs. And eventually in late summer or in fall, egg masses are laid and then those make it through the winter. So one generation per year. 
Now, in terms of the damage that is caused by this insect, both the juveniles and the adults have tubular sucking type mouth parts. So think of it kind of like a mosquito mouth part, except in take, instead of taking a blood meal, these are feeding on fluids, i.e. sap from plants. So they're really restricted to a liquid diet. And specifically, they feed on the phloem, where we know there's a lot of sugars in the plant. Now, I, I mentioned this earlier, but we see some shifts in feeding preferences of the different life stages. So when they are very young, uh, those nymphs or juveniles, they tend to feed on softer, more succulent tissue. So that could be leaves or foliage, or perhaps even petioles or th uh, thin barked small branches and stems, things like that. So that's often going to be herbaceous plants or maybe some shrubs or the smaller twigs on young trees and things like that. But as they reach maturity, that fourth instar juvenile and also the adults, they like to feed on more woody plants. So if you were to follow these insects, uh, throughout the course of the growing season, they're going to move between different plants in the landscape to accommodate uh, their feeding preferences at that time. Now, what are the main impacts we actually get from damage? Well, again, these things are sucking fluids out of the plant, so that can cause some stress to plants. You might get discoloration. They're also kind of messy eaters, so where they poke their mouth parts into the plant, you get some oozing sugars uh, coming out, so you get these oozing wounds. If they're abundant enough, you can actually get some dieback of the canopy of the plant. And again, these things are phloem feeders. They drink so much sugar out of the plant. Their gut, their digestive system can't process it all. So they have a bunch of sugar in their excrement or waste that they excrete. We call that honeydew. So it's basically raining down sugar water from these insects and their waste. Uh, you get this sticky, glossy appearance. That aesthetically is not something that you want to have. And also, once you get honeydew, you can get other problems associated with that. You can get secondary scavenging insects like ants, uh, paper wasps, yellow jackets, other things showing up to feed on that. You can also get uh, sooty mold, fungus and bacteria and stuff like that that can grow on that honeydew can lead to some rather kind of icky and aesthetic uh, problems caused by this insect. Uh, for agricultural crops, we have seen decreases in yield. For landscape plants, it's probably going to be more of an aesthetic issue, especially for larger, more mature trees. But again, this thing can cause a lot of headaches for a lot of different folks out there. Now, in general, this insect probably isn't going to kill plants, especially large established plants in the landscape, but it can be very, very messy. And again, for agricultural crops like grapes, uh, which are a preferred host of this insect, uh, that can be a concern there for growers. Growers will either have to spray a lot for this insect or they're gonna have reduced yields. And I've seen some numbers for like Pennsylvania impact on grape industry, and it's something like seven to $8 million in kind of a worst case scenario. So that's a, a big hit that grape growers could take here in Wisconsin or elsewhere. Uh, and also if it's on certain plants, it can kill them. So usually it won't kill plants, but things like tree of heaven, grapes, and also black walnut is another preferred host. Those can be killed as well. And black walnut can be pretty common here in Wisconsin. Now, in terms of their host plants, I mentioned that this insect has a broad host plant range. It has been documented feeding on over a hundred different types of plants. And keep in mind that list is only going to increase over time. For the longest period, it was only in Asia. Now that it's in North America and it's expanding its range, it's going to uh, encounter different plants it maybe hasn't seen before, and it may be able to feed on those. So this is a snapshot of what we know, but this is not a complete list, and this list is going to expand over time. So first and foremost, a preferred host would be that invasive tree I mentioned earlier, tree of heaven, which I'll talk more uh, in a, a slide or two about, just so you can know what that looks like. I will also highlight grapes, uh, which are on the bottom in red. That's another preferred host where we have seen lots of problems here in the US. In terms of landscape trees and shrubs, if and when spotted lanternfly arrives here in Wisconsin, that's where I'm expecting to get uh, the majority of my calls and complaints about this insect causing damage to either damaging the plants noticeably or just being a general nuisance. Some of their preferred or, or at least things they're found on host plants, uh, maples, they really seem to like some of the silver maples and red maples and hybrids of those. Uh, oaks can be fed on sycamore, tulip trees, beeches, willows, walnuts would be another one that we have seen lots of reports of them on from the eastern U.S. and elsewhere. Poplars, black locusts, uh, even some uh, woody shrubs like roses and other things. And then also uh, herbaceous plants uh, could be perennial flowers that some of the juveniles like to feed on. We have seen some issues in fruit trees. So stone fruit like peaches, plums, there's some concerns there. Apples and related fruits as well. 
when spotted lanternfly first got in the US, we saw quite a few more reports of those. Uh, we're not seeing as many these days, but grapes still jump out as a very strongly preferred host plant for this insect. So big concern there. Now let's talk very briefly. I have two slides about tree of heaven. I just want you to be aware of what it is. It's not terribly common here in Wisconsin, but I'd like you to be familiar with it and perhaps keep an eye out for it. A reason I mention this is this is a very strongly preferred host plant for this insect, probably number one on their list. And so if you know that you have some of these in your area, that's where I would keep a close eye for this insect to potentially show up. And we have some efforts like that along those lines going on in the state where folks have documented where Tree of Heaven is, and we're keeping a close eye on those as kind of sentinel trees to look for a spotted lanternfly when it shows up. So this is a non-native invasive tree here in Wisconsin, not terribly common, but it can get to be pretty good size, upwards of about 80 feet tall. In terms of the leaves, they have these very large compound leaves that can be upwards of some sometimes four feet long. So one to four feet long. A lot of cases, it may be more in that range of one to three-ish, but uh, it's compound leaf. So all these individual leaflets and a single compound leaf might have anywhere from 10 to 40 of these smooth leaflets. They also have these uh, kind of vertically oriented or, or kind of standing up uh, pale flowers, either whitish or kind of off-white or yellowish. We see that in the bottom right-hand photo. Those eventually, when they're pollinated, they produce the samaras or the seeds, if you will. They might remind you kind of of the ones we see on maples. They're reddish. That that's what we can see in the upper right hand photo. And then I also want to mention the bark of the tree uh, of Tree of Heaven is fairly unique. It's relatively smooth. A lot of our landscape trees here in the state of Wisconsin have bark that's fairly rough. If you're familiar with a hackberry tree, that would be a good example of a tree with some really deep, very distinctive ridges on the bark. On Tree of Heaven, the bark is smoother. Uh, when it's young, it's going to be a little bit more greenish, but uh, when it's a little bit older, it's going to be more grayish, brownish. And in my mind, it really kind of reminds me of like the skin, uh, the texture of a cantaloupe. So kind of burn that into your memory. It's a relatively uh, smooth bark tree. So that's what it looks like. But again, with the type of leaflets, those big compound leaves with a bunch of leaflets on it, this could sometimes be mistaken for some of our native plants here, like some of the sumac, um, certain types of walnuts um, and, and hickory and things like that, and even some of the ashes as well, although ashes we know from emerald ash borer are kind of fading out over time. Now, just to give you an idea of where Tree of Heaven is, well, let's start with the map on the right-hand uh, portion of the slide. So that's a national map, uh, again, not native to Wisconsin uh, or some of the other areas, but uh, you can see it's got a very strong presence in those mid-Atlantic states. So not only is the climate condition good in southeastern Pennsylvania, but uh, they seem to have a fair amount of Tree of Heaven around as well. Here in Wisconsin, we're doing a little bit better because we don't seem to have tons of Tree of Heaven around, but where we do see it, it tends to be kind of the southern part of the state, especially southeastern Wisconsin. So if we shift our attention to more of that map on the left-hand portion, we can see some reports from like Milwaukee area, some here in uh, Dane County and Madison area, and, and just outside of it, possibly up towards Sauk County area, uh, the Lake Winnebago area up towards Washcott. Oshkosh in that part of the state. So not terribly abundant here, but we do have some around. And again, that's a preferred host plant. So if you know you have this in your area, I would keep a very close eye on those trees of heaven. Now, I talked about this earlier, but we do see that shift in host plants. So if we start at that nine o'clock position as eggs, that's how they overwinter. In the spring months, we get those early instar nymphs, and they're feeding on things like foliage, petioles, thin bark of twigs, small twigs, small branches, things like that. But eventually, those start shifting and feeding more on woody plants as they get to that fourth juvenile instar or substage when they are red and black. And then the uh, fully formed adults strongly prefer woody plants. So that's when they're feeding on landscape trees, tree of heaven, uh, fruit trees, and in some cases as well. So they do have this shift in their feeding preferences over time. This is a chart uh, borrowed from Penn State. They have a lot of excellent uh, information published on spotted lanternfly. And again, this just illustrates some of the shifts that we can see in feeding preferences of these insects as they mature. So again, early on as young juveniles, things like roses, perennial flowers, uh, those will be fed on early on, but not by the more mature stages, i.e. the adults. So they might start feeding on those, but eventually they shift towards woodier plants. Now I do want to point out both grape and tree of heaven 
are excellent host plants for these insects. And it turns out a uh, spotted lanternfly can basically complete their entire life cycle on those plants. They don't need anything else. They can hatch out of the egg, feed on it as juveniles all the way through the adult stage, and they generally do okay. There are some other trees that will be fed on as mature nymphs or juveniles or as the adults. So this is where we start seeing them on things like maples, the silver and red maples, uh, black walnut, willows, sumacs, and other things as well. So again, we do see this shift in feeding patterns over time. Just to expand upon the damage a little bit more and, and to tie in with some of the feeding host preferences and, and shifts that we see. So on the left, we can see spotted lanternfly juveniles. We know they're young juveniles because they're black with white spots. And in that photo on that rose bush, we can see at least a dozen, if not more, feeding on that particular uh, portion of that rose bush. So again, if you have uh, dozens of these feeding on a plant, that might cause some discoloration, some potential dieback of perennial of shrubs like this. So there's some concern there. Uh, where we're probably going to see more issues is with the more mature juveniles and with the adults because they can really make a messy situation. So let's shift our attention to the photograph on the right hand portion of this slide. This is a common scene in some parts of the mid-Atlantic states where there are high spotted lanternfly populations. You just get hundreds, if not thousands, of these feeding on uh, large mature trees. So again, that ties in with the, the shift in uh, feeding preferences. They go to these woody plants where they are more robust. They can stick their mouth parts through the bark. And again, if you have a whole bunch of these sucking sap out, they're excreting that sticky honeydew. So you get this sugary substance at the base of trees and on the ground. Then you can get uh, microbial growth on that yeast, fungi, bacteria, et cetera. And so that's what we're seeing in this center photo. That sap has come down. You can also get oozing from the feeding wounds of these insects. That might be a potential concern for pathogens getting in at some point, uh, but it just makes a really, really messy situation. And for the most part, no one's gonna wanna go out in their yard and have thousands of these on their trees. So that's a bigger impact and, and very noticeable impact that we'll probably see if or when spotted lanternfly arrives here in Wisconsin. Now, in terms of management, and by the way, because this insect is not here in Wisconsin yet, I'm really not going to go very deep into the management today. That's not uh, the goal of today's talk. It was more to increase general awareness. But I do want to highlight some of the approaches that are being used in parts of the uh, U.S. like Pennsylvania, where this insect is a big problem. There are some cultural things we can do, so non-chemical things, like actually looking for those egg masses. Uh, in theory, if you look through the winter months and you're finding egg masses on the underside of your car and in other locations, you can scrape those off and discard them. That is a very helpful management approach. You can also generally scout for the adults and the juveniles. There's some things you could do with those, anything from squishing to knocking them into a container of soapy water. Another consideration would be if you have Tree of Heaven in your yard or in your neighborhood, there may be some ways to go through and remove that. Again, if that is a strongly preferred host plant for this insect, if we take that out of the equation, that might help us out to a certain extent in the long run. We also have some physical means of removal. I talked about this a moment ago, but if we go out and scout and find the egg masses or the juveniles or the adults, we can actually remove those and take those out of the equation or for the, the juveniles or adults actually squish and kill those. There are also some traps that have been done for the juveniles because, again, these things can't fly, so they tend to just walk up plants, especially trees. And so you can see in this photo from the uh, on the upper right hand corner of this slide, what that yellow band is, that's a very sticky material uh, that has been wrapped around the tree trunk and basically kind of stapled in place with a staple gun. Uh, and then there has been some mesh netting fixed over that to help keep birds and squirrels off of it. But this way, if the insects are trying to climb up that trunk, they'll contact that sticky material and get stuck. So it's somewhat similar in theory to using sticky bands for uh, like spongy moth caterpillars on oak trees and the like. So that's an option for some of the juveniles. I've even even heard of folks simply going out when they have adults and taking the hose attachment on a shop vac and, and sucking them up in large numbers off of the uh, tree trunks. There are also some chemical control options out there. 
Again, uh, growers, farmers, uh, folks managing vineyards in Pennsylvania and other parts of the Eastern US have unfortunately had to rely very heavily on this. There are some options for homeowners as well if and when the time comes. Uh, things like our, our standard kind of pyrethroids, carbaryl, or the older formulation of seven, if you still have it around, that should work. Uh, to a certain extent, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils, especially against the juvenile stages, should be able to help with those. There are also some systemic treatments that are available for trees for the adults, uh, things like imidacloprid, dinotefran. There are also concerns with those. Those are both neonicotinoids. So if you're using it on a tree and that tree is going to flower, there are some concerns uh, potentially for pollinators as well. There are also some dormant oil treatments. This is almost the exact same uh, thing we would would be doing for spongy moth egg masses. So you would go out during the winter months or more the late fall, early spring when things are consistently just above freezing. There's one product in particular called Golden Pass Spray Oil that does list treatments for spotted lanternfly egg masses on the label. Although I will admit that product is pretty hard to find at the moment. I know a lot of folks are trying to find it for spongy moth, but there's been some research that that can work well against egg masses of spotted lanternfly as well. Now, one other quick note about looking for and finding the egg masses of these. Uh, it turns out from some work at Penn State that uh, quite a few of the egg masses may be laid on plants, but in a lot of cases, they're up really high in trees and only about 2% of them are under 10 feet in height. So even though you can go look for these in many situations, they may be out of reach. And I don't want you climbing 30 feet up on a ladder trying to scrape these off um, just because the risk of falling is you know, going to be pretty significant at a point like that. So some of these things, uh, methods of dealing with them do have limitations associated with them. Now, just to wrap things up, what should you do? First and foremost, uh, hopefully now you're familiar with spotted lanternfly, what it looks like so you know uh, what to look for. Also be aware of Tree of Heaven, keep an eye out for it, especially if you're in southeastern Wisconsin and other parts of the state. Uh, we do have some good resources out there on spotted lanternfly, and I'm helping uh, colleagues develop a spotted lanternfly page on our Extension horticulture site, so stay tuned for that. But we do currently have some fact sheets, both through Extension on the right, and then the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection does have a fact sheet bulletin out there as well. And then the final thing, if you think you have spot found spotted lanternfly please 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 let us know either myself at the insect diagnostic lab or probably better yet uh, just google search spotted lanternfly wisconsin or a very short web address for this insect is slf for spotted lanternfly slf wi.gov that will get you to the Wisconsin Department of Ag webpage for this insect and on that page they have a, a form that you can fill out if you think you have found spotted lanternfly and someone will follow up with you very quickly to investigate further because we want to catch this as soon as it gets into the state so that hopefully we can uh, control it or limit its spread. And with that said, I just want to wrap up by uh, mentioning my lab, which is the UW Insect Diagnostic Lab, where I do identify insects for folks, spot a lanternfly and other things as well. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out my website, insectlab.russell.wisc.edu, or if you simply do a Google search for UW Insect Diagnostic Lab, you can find my website and how to submit samples to the lab for identification. And with that, I will hand it over for any time for questions. And again, I just want to put out a reminder that if you're looking for handouts from today's talk, I do have them available on my website and you can find them from this particular webpage URL listed on this slide.